In our Potawatomi language, I've just given you a traditional greeting of how happy I am to be here. Um, Miigwech kinegego, gamijang, gratitude for everything that we have been given. And to tell you that I'm a Potawatomi woman of the Bear Clan and adopted into the Eagles, and that I feel such a privilege to be able to share some of the stories that have been shared with me, with you today. And I think, and I know actually, that I'm not going to tell you anything today that you don't already know. And that's a good thing. Because our elders tell us that our job as humans is to remember, to remember. And I want to say miigwech, thank you to one another as people. It is beautiful to sit here and look at all these wonderful faces and the sunlight coming in and the light coming out. Um, gratitude for this beautiful day and the journeys that have brought us here. Gratitude for the privilege of our work here together. And gratitude for the companions of these oaks and these grasses and the butterflies and the fog. As someone who just came from a place where there are still three feet of snow on the ground, <laughs> I am grateful for it all. <laughs> the everyday miracles. And I think I would like to begin this morning at a literary conference with the oldest kind of storytelling. I think it feels right to have the oral tradition represented in a literary conference, the oldest way of storytelling. And so I want to share with you just a little piece of a story that is tremendously important for me. It's a real guiding story for me. And it's a story which is shared by peoples throughout the Great Lakes. Anishinaabe people tell this creation story, and our Haudenosaunee neighbors tell it as well. It's a story of women and the land. In the beginning, there was the sky world where our people lived much as they do here on earth, raising their families, tending their gardens, walking in the forest. And in that forest, there grew the great tree of life. And this is a very special tree because on every branch was a different food, a different medicine. All of the plants grew on the branches of this one tree. And one day a great windstorm came and blew down that tree and left a big hole in the ground. We all know what that looks like. And like all of us, being curious, a beautiful woman who we call Gish Kokwe, the sky woman, walked over to that hole, looked down to see what was there. It was just all black. She couldn't see anything. And so she stepped a little bit closer to look. And suddenly the ground began crumbling at the edge and crumbling beneath her feet. And she reached out to stop herself by grabbing on to a branch of that tree. And the branch broke off in her hand. And she fell like a maple seed pirouetting on the autumn breeze. And a column of light streamed from that hole in the sky world, marking her path where only darkness had been before. But in that emptiness, there were many gazing up at that sudden shaft of light, and they saw there this small object, just a dust moat in the beam. And as it grew closer, they could see that it was a woman with her arms outstretched and her long black hair swirling around her as she spiraled toward them. And the geese all nodded at one another. They knew what to do. And in a wave of goose music, they rose as one and went up to meet her. And she felt the beat of their wings underneath her as they broke her fall. And she fell into the embrace of soft feathers. And so it began. We are told that from the very first encounter between humans 
and the other beings of the earth was one of care and one of responsibility, born on the strong wings of geese. And the world at that time was covered entirely by water. There was no land. And so the geese couldn't hold Sky Woman much longer. And so they called a council of all of the water beings together to decide what they would do for this visitor. And so the swans, the beavers, the fish, everybody came together and a great turtle floated in that watery gathering. And he said, here, rest her on my back while you decide what to do. And they talked and they talked. And someone remembered that they had heard a story Stories are so important. A story of earth down at the bottom of the water. And they said, we should go get her some. That's what she needs. And so the loon, Mong, being the strongest of the swimmer, said, I'll go. I'll go get it. You know loons, they're pretty cocky. Um, and he went down, and, and, and he was gone a really long time. And he came up just shaking his beak. And he couldn't get it. It was too deep. It was too far. There were deep pressures. Was, he couldn't do it. And so the sturgeon said, I will. You see how this story unfolds. Every one of them said, I'll do it. And everyone failed. Everyone. Until there was just the little muskrat left. And he said, I'll go. And so his relatives looked at him pretty skeptically. But he flailed and paddled his little legs as he went down. He was gone a really long time, a really long time. And bubbles rose from the water. And all the other animals feared the worst for their relative. And indeed, his little limp body floated up to the surface. And then they noticed that his hand, so like a human hand, was clenched. And when they opened his fingers, there was the mud. There was the earth. He had died giving his help to this human. And the turtle said, spread this on my back. And so they gave the mud to Sky Woman resting there. And with her hand open, she spread the mud across the back of the turtle. And in deep gratitude for the gifts and the care and the compassion of these other beings, she began to dance. She began to do the women's dance where your feet never leave the earth, caressing the earth. And out of her gratitude, the earth began to grow. And she began to sing. She began to sing songs of beauty and creation and gratitude. And the earth grew and grew until it became what we know today as Turtle Island. And remember, Sky Woman didn't come empty-handed. That branch had broken off in her hand. So she had all the medicines, all the food plants, all the grasses, all the trees. She brought those seeds, and she spread them over the back of the turtle. And it said that the first plant to grow is this one. In our language, we call her wingashk, the sweet grass. And so the sweet grass, we understand, is the hair of Mother Earth, because it was the first plant to grow. And we always braid it. Because if you think about that feeling that passes between the braider and the one whose hair is being braided is of such intimacy, tender, loving care, the fragrant braid of sweet grass is our reminder of that first bond between women and the land. Our oldest teachings from this first woman and the land remind us that reciprocity is the thread that binds us together. They were her life raft at the beginning of the world, and now so much closer to the end. We must be theirs. And so it began the story of women in the land which we gather here to celebrate, just this fragment of a creation story. But whether her name is Sky Woman, or Spider Woman, or Changing Woman, or the goddess Ki, or Gaia, or Eve, our origin stories, the stories of who we are in the world and how we might live, always have a cast of characters, which are women and the land. That bond is deep and enduring, so often mediated by the plants that she brought in her hand. We know them, don't we? For isn't the earth always shifting under our feet? Aren't we all at some time? 
falling into a new world and trying to make a home. And in this era of accelerating climate change, in the era of the sixth extinction, we know we stand at a crumbling edge. And like Sky Woman, we ask, what can we grab onto to stop the fall? What are the gifts that we can carry with us through this time to make a home on the other side? And most importantly, how do we care for the other beings who have cared for us since the beginning of time? And this time that we live in of great change and of great choices has been spoken of by our ancestors in the teachings known as the prophecies of the seventh fire, a long story, an important story, just a tiny fragment again of this this morning. In the long migration of our Anishinaabe ancestors, after the arrival of the newcomers and after all the losses of land, of language, of the sacred ways, of each other. Prophecy and history converge. And it's said that people will find themselves in a time when you can no longer fill a cup from a stream and drink. These long ago prophecies spoke of a time when the air will become too thick to breathe. And the plants and animals who have always cared for us will begin to turn their faces away. And it's said that we will know in the time of the seventh fire that we stand all together at a fork in the road. And one of those paths is soft and green and all spangled with dew. You could walk barefoot on it. It invites you. And one of those paths is black and burnt. And it's all cinders that would cut your feet. And we know which path we want. And the prophecy tells us that we have to make a choice between the path of materialism and the path of spirituality and care and compassion of bimadizuin, of following the good life. And we're told that before we can choose that soft green path, we can't just charge forward. That instead the people of the seventh fire must indeed turn backwards and remember to remember to walk back along that path and pick up what was left for us. The stories, the teachings, the songs, each other are more than human relatives who lay scattered along that path. And our language. And only when we found these once again and placed them in our bundles, the things that will heal us, the things that we love too much to lose, can, then can we walk forward on that green path? And it's all the world's people, everyone together, you and me. And these are the questions that we face at the crossroads. What do we find along the ancestors' path that will heal us and bring us back into balance? What do we love too much to lose and what will we do to protect it, to carry it through the narrows of climate change as we come safely safely to the other side. For there is another side, and the prophecy of the seventh fire tells us that the people of the seventh fire will need great courage and creativity and wisdom, and they need to do it together, but that they will lead the way toward the lighting of the eighth fire. And it's said that that is us today, that we are the people of the seventh fire, who will begin to reweave the world. And that path that we're called to travel is one of many, each on our own good road. And we're asked to mark that path for those who follow us, just as it was marked for us. That route for me is a pathway through the geography of hope. And as writers, we mark that path with our stories. We mark that path with our words, with the power of words. And our Potawatomi stories tell us that a long time ago when Turtle Island was brand new, the people and the plants and the animals all spoke the same language and they conversed freely with one another. But we've forgotten how to do that. And as our dominance has grown, we have become more isolated, more lonely on this planet when we can no longer call our neighbors by name. If we're to manifest the values of the Sky Woman story, we have to learn once again to call one another by name. 
and by name to call on one another for help. It's said that Sky Woman went back to the sky and looks over women and the land with the visage today of Grandmother Moon. And we say that she left teachers behind her, and those teachers are the plants. And in this time of the sixth extinction, of coming climate chaos, we could use some teachers. It's a good thing we don't have to figure everything out for ourselves. Singing whales, talking trees, dancing bees, birds who make art, fish who navigate, plants who learn and remember. We're forgotten that we are surrounded by intelligences other than our own, by feathered people and leafed people. And there are many forces arrayed to help us forget, and it, even the language that we speak, the beautiful English language, makes us forget through a simple grammatical error that has grave consequences for us all. Let me share with you a poem by one of my literary heroes, and maybe one of yours, of women in the land, Mary Lou Aweokta, a Cherokee poet. Her poem is called, When Earth Becomes an It. When the people call the earth mother, they take with love and they give back with love so that all may live. And when the people call earth it, they use her. They consume her strength and then the people die. Already the sun is hot, out of season. Our mother's breast is growing dry. She is taking all green into her heart and she will not turn back until we call her by her name. I'm a beginning student of my Anishinaabe language, trying to reclaim what was washed from the mouths of children in the boarding schools, children like my grandfather. So I'm paying a lot of attention to grammar lately. Grammar is how we chart relationships in language and with the earth. Imagine your grandmother standing at the stove in her apron, making you soup, she's feeding you, and someone says, oh look, it has gray hair. Right, we laugh at that, don't we? But we recoil from that too, because it is suddenly our grandmother is robbed of kinship, of respect, of personhood. That's what happens when we call someone an it. And yet, in English, we speak of our beloved Grandmother Earth, who makes us soup every day in exactly that way as it. The English language allows no form of respect for the more than human beings with whom we share the Earth. In English, you're either a human or you are an it. An objectification of the natural world reinforces the notion that our species is somehow more deserving of the gifts of the earth than any of the other 8.7 million species with whom we share the planet. Using it absolves us of moral responsibility and opens the door to exploitation. When sugar maple is it, we can pick up the chainsaw. When it's she, we have to think twice. But in, in my language, it's impossible to speak of that maple as it. There is no it for birds or berries or sturgeon or rocks. And our language does not divide the world into him and her, but into animate and inanimate. And the grammar of animacy is applied to all that lives, mayflies, blueberries, boulders, and rivers. We refer to other members of the living world with the same language that we use for our family, because it's our family. What would it be like to be part of a family that includes birches and beavers and butterflies? We'd be less lonely. We'd feel like we belonged, and we'd be smarter. In indigenous ways of knowing other species are recognized not just as persons, but also as teachers who inspire how we might live. And we can learn a new solar economy from plants, medicines from mycelia, architecture from the ants. And by learning from other species, we might even learn humility. <laughs> Colonization, as we know, attempts to replace indigenous cultures with the culture of the settler. And one of the tools is linguistic imperialism, or the overriding of languages and names. 
And among the many examples of linguistic imperialism, perhaps none is more pernicious than the replacement of language of nature as subject with the language of nature as object. And we see the consequences of that grammar, just that grammar, around us every day. And so here, in this wonderful community of readers and writers, of story makers, of lovers of words, let me make a modest proposal, just a small thing, the transformation of the English language. <laughs> Are you in? <laughs> Let me invite you to join an experiment for a kind of reverse linguistic imperialism, a shift in worldview through the humble work of the, pro of the pronoun, revolutionary pronouns. Language has always been changeable and adaptive. We lose words that we don't need anymore, and we invent the ones that we need. We don't need a worldview of earth beings as objects anymore. That thinking has led us to the precipice of climate chaos. That's the kind of thinking that makes the tar sands possible. Itting the world calls for mountaintop removal. This is not a language that we need anymore. We need a new word with its roots in ancient ways. And so to consider how to bring animacy to the English language, I sought the wisdom of my elders and my language teachers. And English, of course, is a secular language. We add words to it all the time, as we like. But Anishinaabemowin is a sacred language, and there are protocols for doing that. And so my teacher and fluent speaker, Stuart King, reminded me of this, of the protocol that respects the sanctity of the language and how to do it with mutual respect. He pointedly reminded me that our language bears no responsibility to heal a society that systematically sought to exterminate it. But at the same time, the elders teach that this knowledge, these traditional ways, this traditional philosophy has stayed with us because there would come a time when the whole world would need it. And that's where we are today. And so Stuart suggested that the proper word for beings of the earth is bemadazi aki, when I heard that word, I just wanted to run through the, words, the woods and say it over and over again. I was just so glad that to know that there is a word for the living, being, inspirited ones with whom we share the earth. But I recognized that Bamadizi Aki wouldn't fit easily <laughs> into English to do its work of transformation. And so we need new English words to carry that meaning. Bamadizi Aki. That last part of the word means the land. What if our new pronoun, the pronoun of the revolution, was key, key, to signify a being of the living earth? Not he, not she, but key. So that when we speak of the sugar maple, we say, oh, that beautiful tree, key is giving us sap again this spring. And we'll need a plural pronoun, too, for those earth beings. And in this case, English already has the right word. Let's make that new pronoun kin. So we can now refer to the birds and the trees not as things, but as our earthly relatives. On a crisp October morning, we can look up at the geese and say, look, kin are flying south for the winter. Come back soon. Language can be a tool for cultural transformation. Make no mistake, ki and kin are pronouns of transformation, pronouns to shape our thoughts and our actions. And on behalf of the living world, however we do it, let us learn to speak the grammar of animacy. We can keep it for bulldozers, <laughs> paper clips. But every time we say ki, let our words reaffirm our respect and our kinship with the more than human world. Let us speak of the beings of the earth as the kin that they are. I want to close with invoking a dear friend and mentor of mine 
who is part of marking the path to that seventh fire. And that wonderful woman is Audrey Shenandoah. The broadside that has been so beautifully prepared by artists and by um, letterpress printers that it's available here bears a quote from Audrey Shenandoah that I want to close with. But first, can I just tell you one or two things about Audrey? Oh my goodness, she's so wonderful. We, she passed away about two years ago now, but she's still with us right now. Um, and Audrey is a, a cultural um, knowledge holder, a fluent speaker, a teacher, a generous woman who always held your hand when she talked to you. And she was a leader in the Haudenosaunee environmental movement. She brought the message of peacemaking with the earth all over the earth, including to the United Nations. She's revered as a, as, a, as a grandmother in every sense of the word. And let me just close with her words. Being born as humans to this earth is a very sacred trust. We have a sacred responsibility because of the sac special gift that we have, which is beyond the fine gifts of the plant life, the fish, the woodlands, the birds, and all the other living things on earth we're able to take care of them. I think of Audrey as, as absolutely a descendant of Gish Kokwe, the Sky Woman. She embodies that covenant of reciprocity that to care for the world as the world cares for us. And with that, I say miigwech. So delighted to be here. Thank you for listening.